This is COVID-19 Seattle. I'm Dave Ross. And I'm Aaron Granillo. President Trump is touting, in his words, a very historic breakthrough. The FDA has issued an emergency use authorization, and uh, that's such a, a powerful term, emergency use authorization for a treatment known as convalescent plasma. More than 70,000 patients have already been administered convalescent plasma as a treatment for COVID-19. And our own medical consultant, Dr. Gordon Cohen, explains to us how it works. Take somebody who's already been sick. They've built up antibodies. Those antibodies were built up in their body to fight off the coronavirus infection. And it's sort of like they've been vaccinated. So you're taking the plasma fraction and then you're transfusing it into somebody who's who's sick. And in theory, the antibody-rich plasma should benefit the COVID-infected patient. But as Dr. Cohen told me, there are some concerns about the data behind its effectiveness. They're throwing around numbers and saying that 35% of patients who get it get better. So 35 out of 100 people have recovered. As we've talked about before, there's no randomized controlled double-blind study. So... Would those 35 people have gotten better no matter what? Or did the plasma they got actually help to make them better? So there was no placebo test. Right. There's, I mean, you're just giving it to everybody. All right. So how should we frame this emergency use authorization of convalescent plasma? Is it a big deal? Well, it gives flexibility to those who were thinking of doing it and were worried about whether there was enough data or not. I guess what they're saying is since it doesn't necessarily harm you, Why not allow this as a treatment uh, for doctors and patients who want it? And I guess we'll see long term if it has uh, if it has an effect. But what Dr. Cohen is saying is without a placebo test, you cannot conclusively say that it was, in fact, the plasma transfusion that cured the patient. Right. And I think we should also just take a step back and say this is not some sort of miracle treatment. Right. I mean, this has been happening for months now. I think the University of Washington had been using it since March. Um, And yeah, I mean, it it doesn't hurt you, so why not give it a whirl? But I think to say that this is some sort of game changer, um, I don't know, it might be a little duplicitous. Right. It's not the vaccine. It doesn't prevent you from getting the illness. This is for people who've already come down with it and supposedly will get them out of the hospital sooner. Is it safe to open schools in Washington for in-person learning? Well, the head of the Center for Disease Control, Dr. Robert Redfield, weighed in. He tells our sister station, KTTH and Jason Rantz, that the overall positivity rate for the coronavirus across the state is less than 5%. And he says that is low enough for them to say that in most of the state, it is safe to go back to the classroom. But he also says each school district has to do what's right for them. It's going to have to be done on a school district by school district. But you have a lot of your state. Your overall prevalence of tests being positive has really dropped now under 5 percent. And going back to classrooms, he says, is a public health issue. It's in the public health interest, kids K through 12, to get back to face to face learning. Not only is this important for their academic advancement, but it's really important also uh, for uh, mental health services frequently nutritional. And yet, as we know, many of the biggest school districts in western Washington are beginning the year with remote learning. Are we being overly cautious here? I'm not sure if that's even the question. It's whether teachers are willing to go back to the classroom and feel secure about it. So we've heard that the, the children are not especially uh, affected by this, although, you know, with a caveat that some clearly are. But from what I've heard, and this a lot of this, Aaron, is anecdotal from some of the, mm-hmm. the teachers I know, they feel very insecure about going into a classroom where kids might not be as careful about mask wearing as they would like because you're in a you're in a classroom with 25 or more children each of whom goes home to a, mm-hmm. a family circle which may be infected maybe not you don't know and i think a big part of this is does the staff feel safe yeah i mean i i guess where i struggle here is that there really shouldn't be a debate as to whether or not <laughs> like outbreaks will happen i I, I have a two and a half year old. I've never been more sick <laughs> since having a kid and, right. and her going to daycare. It's like kids bring home sicknesses. Um, so, I mean, I think it's only a matter of time before there are outbreaks at schools. And I don't know if they shut down fully, but at least they'll have to be closed for a couple of weeks and, and cleaned.
we come back to the same conclusion. Until the vaccine is here and everybody can get it, there will always be that lingering feeling of insecurity that it isn't quite conquered yet, and do we want to take the risk? And CDC Director Robert Redfield did offer help to any school district which needs it. I've said to any school district, CDC is happy to provide additional guidance, technical assistance to help them figure out how to take our guidance and practically make it work for their situation. Parties on Washington State University's Greek Row have caused a substantial increase in COVID-19 cases. And class hasn't even started there yet. The university opted to start the fall semester online, and that kicks off today. But some students have returned to campus anyways. Police told Como 4 News that they've been called to at least a dozen parties along Greek Row. One party had more than 50 people. Unclear if anybody was wearing masks there. Uh, Mary Ginther is a junior and a sorority member at Washington State University. I do know... A lot of the Greek houses are trying to take it as seriously as possible, but college kids are college kids, unfortunately. Each fraternity and sorority sets its own rules for social distancing and quarantining, and some have been less strict than others. Right now, law enforcement is taking an educational approach rather than issuing harsh penalties, but students could face fines if the parties continue. Uh, this isn't surprising at all to me, Dave. What about you? <laughs> that, that kids want a party? Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. No. Yeah. Uh, I also don't see the value of fining kids or sending out the cops. I don't. Is, is that really going to stop it or just make a lot of people angry while the parties continue? Uh, this is something that's going to have to... Uh, that's going to have to play out, I'm afraid. I, I don't know how you tell people, say, it's okay to go to college, but then isolate yourself mm-hmm. from all your friends, from your professors, from your from the other students. I think that's going to be a very tough sell. We will be back tomorrow and every day after with a 10-minute rundown of the daily local news. You can subscribe to this podcast. You can also find our news coverage on MyNorthwest.com or listen live at 97.3 FM.